emerged from the Jesus Seminar research and has resulted in its future agenda is a two-pronged attack on the very foundations of Christianity. Again, to state it very bluntly, if Jesus is not the divine third person of the Trinity, but a wandering prophet whose message was one of radical inclusivity and who preached about a kingdom of justice and peace, then how do we restate the traditional understandings of Christian doctrines such as the Incarnation? And secondly, how can we speak of God today? And uh, a typical example of that is it reasonable to believe in the notion of a God involved in the very fabric of creation in the wake of the tsunamis that have devastated much of Southeast Asia and Africa and left over 300,000 people dead. It's not the proper response to wonder if there is a God at all. As the biologist and Darwinian Richard Dawkins eloquently expresses it, not only does science know why the tsunami happened, it can give precious hours of warning. If a small fraction of the tax breaks handed out to churches, mosques and synagogues had been diverted into an early warning system, tens of thousands of people now dead would have been moved to safety. Let's get up off our knees, stop cringing before bogeymen and virtual fathers, face reality and help science to do something constructive about human suffering. So according to Dawkins, science, not God, will give you the secrets of the tsunami. Well, the two attacks are inextricably linked, as Bob Funk says. Christian theologians have traditionally held that Jesus is God. If Jesus is not God, or at least the Son of God, we'll have to revise our notions of God. However, the old concept of God has suffered erosion in and of itself. We can no longer understand God as the creator of the species. We can no longer understand God as an interventionist tyrant, as he's depicted in the Old Testament. God has become mostly unemployed as the old doctrines have atrophied. At the same time, our notions of the physical universe have left God homeless. The problem we face is that God is not a primary datum. An experience of God, or a revelation from God, is an interpreted experience, since there is no such thing as an uninterpreted experience. It seems that we have invented God in our own image. Well, the God problem, or the crisis in belief about God, has been resolved by theologians attached to the Western Institute in two ways. The first is what has been described as panentheism and is illustrated most tellingly in the books of Bishop John Shelby Spong. It's what might also be described as liberal Christianity. And you'll hear about that in the next part of this session. The second way is perhaps more controversial, and as Spong himself described it to me when he visited Perth a couple of years ago, it's a position to the left of where even he wishes to be. It's good to know that there are people even more radical than Bishop Spong. <laughs> well, it's, it's called Lone Realism, and it's synonymous with the writings of Don Cupid and Lloyd Gearing, and it's what I've called Radical Christianity. And we'll hear about all that in our second session this morning from 11 till 12. So this morning I'll use uh, Bishop Spong, Don Cupid and Lloyd Gearing as templates for discussing panentheism and non-realism. And also attempt to show the roots of these thinkers and the theological odyssey that they've undertaken in conversation with some of the most important philosophers and theologians of the last two centuries. There's also a fourth issue which is not addressed by the Jesus Seminar and which, following Bob Funk's advice in The Once and Future Faith, that West Star should turn rebellion into revolution by expanding the contours of faith, we need to tackle this issue. It's usually assumed that the Christian battle lines, especially here in America, 
are drawn between the liberal and the fundamentalist. However, that proposition, I will argue this afternoon, is only part of a larger picture of religious and spiritual searching, which is perhaps eloquently described as the divine supermarket in a book by the same name by Melise Ruthven. You see, I come from a country that has been described as the most secular nation on earth. There's usually a very good Antipodean rivalry between New Zealand and Australia as to who is the most non-religious country. I'll claim it for Australia today. But even that, I believe, is a myth and a misconception about our respective countries. You see, even in Australia, I'm aware of a proliferation of religious options. There is a widespread rejection of Christianity and the rise of what I will label as grassroots spirituality, which is, if the research is correct, is potentially far greater numerically than organized religions. Today, there is, around the world, a spirituality revolution taking place. It's being fueled by those at the grassroots, by ordinary folk who are moving away from the historic religions and forging a multitude of spiritual paths. There is what I would call a smorgasbord board of therapeutic spiritualities, and I've got a copyright on that particular phrase, <laughs> available for people to pick and to choose, for there are many there is no need to even bother to cross the thresholds of the local church. And this afternoon, I'll widen the scope of what is deemed as Christianity and religion and investigate the spiritual, spirituality revolution in our midst and ponder how we might respond. There is a populist spiritual, spirituality revolution of the new millennium that disturbs and challenges both liberalism and fundamentalism. I'll attempt to show that it's not an either-or situation, but a much more rich and diverse lang religious landscape that we inhabit in our world. <laughs> 